All right, so lesson 23 here, Jesus heals a leper, and a paralytic. See some miracles that Jesus does, and again, the beginnings of dissension from the Pharisees. So we're going to start in Mark chapter 1, it should be there, and then uh, we will go to Luke chapter 5 here and there, but Mark chapter 1, so I'll start reading here, the first couple of verses at verse 35, okay. So all those people, after being at the Sea of Capernaum, came to Jesus. He was healed, went to bed that evening. And then we read this in verse 35. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place. And there, he, and there prayed. And Simon and they, that were, and they that were with him followed after him. And when they had found him, they said unto him, all men seek for thee. And he said unto them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also. For therefore I came I forth. And he preached in their synagogues throughout all Galilee, and cast out devils. We'll stop there a second. So, Jesus here, wakes up early in the morning, Sets a, a good example for us here in regards to having our devotions. He gets up early in the morning, probably before the others are even awake or up. He rises. Okay? And where does he go? He goes into a solitary place. So he must have gone out somewhere into the wilderness, more than likely. And there, he had time that he could be alone. He could speak to his Heavenly Father. He could pray. Okay. What he prayed about, what he spoke to God about, we don't know, but he was a man, so maybe he needed strength. Okay. He needed to be encouraged by his Heavenly Father because he knew he was about to begin a, a difficult part of his ministry where he was going to be mocked and ridiculed and many were going to question him and his authority and what he was going to do. So he, he prayed for strength. He went to his heavenly Father. And that's a, a good example for us to do too. Go into a solitary place where we won't be bothered and we can focus on God. But of course, maybe Jesus leaving stirred a little bit in the house. And Simon Peter, he arose and he found his master gone. Okay. And maybe... Maybe he looked out and could see the shadow of Jesus leaving or somehow knew where Jesus had gone. But he probably needs a little bit of time to quickly get himself ready, get his clothes, get his shoes. And he wakes his brethren in the house with him and says, well, the master's gone. He's up. He's out. He's out and about. Come on, wake up. Let's get up. We need to follow him. We need to see what he's doing today. And so they arise and they each get ready. And they take off and they go to find Jesus. They want to go look for Him. And they want to find Him. They must not have found Him right away. Okay, they followed after Him. And when they had found Him, so Jesus had enough time to be able to commune with His Heavenly Father. But when they finally found Him, Peter, uh, he says here, All men seek for Thee. In other words, we're looking for thee. We're trying to find you. We want to hear your preaching and teaching. And Jesus here okay, speaks back to Peter and he says, Let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, for therefore came I forth. But Jesus doesn't deny him. He says, Okay, then let's go. So the time of Jesus' devotions with his heavenly Father are done. And it's time for them to go into the, the other towns. Okay, or go back around. So he had... More than likely, Jesus had gone all through Galilee and preached in many towns, and he was going to continue on there. Maybe he would stop back in some of those towns a second time, check in with the people again and do some more preaching and teaching. But that's what he does here. They take off, and they're going to go, and they're going to do some, some work. Jesus is going to teach and preach. And it says there that he, he preached in the synagogues throughout all Galilee and cast out devils. 
And then we have the story of the leper here. So we'll read, continue on in verses 40 through 45 here. If you can take a look there. Verses 40 through 45. And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus, moved with compassion, put forth his hand, and touched him, and saith unto him, I will be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed. And he straightly charged him, and forthwith sent him away. And saith unto him, See thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way. Show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. But he went out and began to publish it much, and to blaze abroad the matter, insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city, but was without the desert places. And they came to him from every quarter. So, what do we see here? Who comes to Jesus, faith? A leper. And I asked in there, okay, what's some symbolism that you can think of with leprosy? Leprosy is a picture of sin. So what's some symbolism? Think of what leprosy does. I asked you that. Garrett? What's well, a symbol of sin? But can we go a little bit deeper than that? Can we can we get a little bit more? Some of you had some fine answers there. Garrett, or I'm sorry, Kenton? All right. Grant? Okay, good. Faith? All right. Yeah, leprosy is a horrible, terrible illness. Okay. Leprosy causes blood or reduces blood flow to parts of the body, and when blood gets cut off to parts of the body, they die. And after they die, and there's no more nourishment going to them, they begin to fall off. So that a person who has the disease of leprosy, their fingers, usually, their toes, maybe ears and noses, areas of the body that have very, very poor blood flow. Or are far out. That's why your fingers and your toes are at the farthest ends of your body. The blood doesn't reach there very well and begins to stop flowing in those areas. And then they die and they fall off. And that's an example. You guys gave some good examples. Just as leprosy can eventually cause death, so sin eventually causes death. But just like sin in our lives can ruin maybe a friendship that we have with someone. Or it can ruin a relationship we have with someone else. Or sin can ruin our lives in certain ways, and so that parts of them become bits and pieces of our lives are falling apart. So we see that here with with leprosy. Okay, so leprosy is a sin, uh, or is a picture of sin that ends in uh, sure death. So this leper comes to Jesus. Notice that the leper came to Jesus. So he had faith. He knew what Jesus could do for him, beseeching him, "If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean." Okay. The sinner knows what the end of his life will be. He's going to have death. Just like we know if we live in sin, what will our eventually, what eventually will be our end? Jesse, what will be my end if I continue to live in sin? Hell. Okay? And so this man comes and we see, well, he comes differently than Naaman. Remember Naaman the leper last year? Naaman came. How does this leper come to Christ different than the way that Naaman came to Elisha? Remember? Think back. Jen? Stood at his house. Right. He felt he was very important, so I'm going to stand here. This man should come out to me. And then when he got the advice of Elisha, what was his reaction? What was Naaman's reaction? Yeah, I don't want to go wash in that dirty, filthy Jordan River. There's got to be a better one somewhere, right? 
How does this man come to Christ? In what way does he come? How is he different from Naaman? What can we say, Joe? How do we know that? You're right. He's humble. But how do, what, what in the text proves that there? What did he do, Kenton? Okay, he goes to Jesus. But what does he do once he gets before Jesus? What does he do? What did it say there in the text? Faith? What's that say there? Anyone? Look in verse 40. How did he come? What did he do? Emma? Hey, kneel down. So he comes in humility. That's how we have to go to Christ too with our sins. We have to humbly come before Christ and kneel down before Him and ask for forgiveness. Confess our sins. Or if we sin against each other or mom and dad, we have to humbly go to them. Not proud. Say, I'm sorry for what I did. I shouldn't have done that. Will you please forgive me? So that's a good example that we see here from this man. And Jesus has compassion on him. Jesus, it says they're moved with compassion. We think of a mother or father. They see their, their injured son or daughter. Or maybe you have a younger brother or sister and you, you feel compassion for them. You, you feel sorry for them. They just, you know, a two-year-old ran into a sharp corner of, of the table at home. and So you go and pick them up and you try to comfort them and console them. And Jesus shows that same compassion here. He feels sorry for him. He feels love towards him because we know that this is a child of God. And so Jesus feels compassion for him, puts forth his hand, touched him, and saith to him, I will be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, the leprosy departed from him. Okay. Jesus felt compassion for this man because of his leprosy. But Jesus also felt compassion because of something else in the man. What else did he feel for the man? Compassion because this man was a what? Not just a leper, but also... Kimberly, what would you say? He wasn't just a leper, but he was also a child of God. A sinner. Jesus felt compassion that way. That gives you and that gives me great hope. That gives us great comfort. Because Jesus feels compassion towards you that same way. So just as you can imagine your mother or father feeling compassion towards you, okay, when you became injured, so he feels compassion okay, to you and me. So he sees into my heart and he sees into your hearts and he sees them and he says, that person is filled with sin, it's filthy and I will forgive them, I will wash their sins from them. And that's what he does here. Not only does Jesus feel compassion for this man because he's a leper and heal him, and Jesus does that, but he also feels compassion for this man because of his filthy, sinful heart, and he cleans his heart too. Was it immediate? That's a beauty again that we see. It's an immediate healing. It's a miracle. It's a wonder here. And Jesus charged him then, See, say thou nothing to know any man. And go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded, for a testimony unto them. So, as was the custom, the people had to go to the priest. Okay. So, he goes to him. We can imagine this man leaving Jesus. And probably not even for ten seconds could the man not keep quiet. And not leap for joy. But you can imagine seeing him walking away from Christ. Not just walking, but almost bounding. A lightness in his step. A big smile on his face. His eyes bright with excitement. He's been given new life. Not just physically, but spiritually. He's alive. And so he's filled with life. And even though Jesus has commanded him to say nothing, the man goes out and he begins to publish it abroad. Everyone knows insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter to the city, but everybody from every quarter of the city came to Jesus wanting to be healed because this man published it abroad. He could not keep still. Hopefully we can either. Jesus has worked in our hearts. He's renewed in our hearts a new heart, and that should give us great joy. Sometimes, sadly, we take things for granted. 
one enjoyable thing that I've been able to see in my life is when you come across someone who didn't grow up as you and I have in a, in a home where our parents love us, our parents care for us. There was uh, a girl approximately my age that I met through a few friends and she had grown up in the Catholic Church as a young girl. And her mom and dad divorced. She didn't come from a very happy or joyful home. And what was amazing is God began to work in her heart in her high school years so that she began to realize something wasn't right with what she was being taught in the Roman Catholic Church. She began to study the Scriptures. She began to understand them. She began to read them herself. She began to go and seek out different churches, begin to find and, and speak with the people going to church there and the ministers and the pastors and learn from them. She began to come to the Protestant Reformed churches just as she went to many others and finally came to the conclusion and began to realize the beauty when she began working with people in the Protestant Reformed churches, what the truth of the scriptures are, that she was, you could say, very similar to Martin Luther. She realized it wasn't her works that would save her anymore, and she was relieved. And then what was very enjoyable to see was she was filled with so much joy after that all the time. She had no trouble at all going to anyone and everyone. If there was a, a great example for me, she would go to work and she would talk to everyone. Can you believe this? Look at this treasure that I found. This is a beautiful treasure. She didn't care if, they didn't, if they'd mock her, make fun of her. She would talk to any and every person and try to tell them and convince them. And that's what we should do too, but... A lot of times, because we've grown up in the church, we take for granted our salvation. We don't, we don't realize how wonderful and miraculous that gift is that God's given you, that He's worked in our hearts. But that's exactly how we should feel. So I was put to shame because I should have acted in that same way too. should never be afraid to go out and tell everyone about the wonderful work that Christ has done. And that's a great example that we can get from this man. He was so filled with joy that he goes out and tells everyone. All right, continuing on here, Jesus in Mark chapter 2 then, verses 1 and 2, and again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together in so much that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door, and he preached the word unto them. So he goes into a house to preach, now we go to uh, Luke chapter 5, so if you have your Bibles out, you can turn there. And that gives us a little bit more information about what Jesus does at this house. So he goes, it says, though Jesus has gone full circle through Galilee, and now he returns back to where he started out in Capernaum, and he goes into this house to preach and teach. And again, throngs of people come in so that there's not room anywhere. There's probably masses of people outside trying to listen Shh, quiet that baby, I can't hear what he's saying in the house. Or, shh, be quiet. We're trying to hear what the master's saying. Don't talk, let's listen. And everyone's jostling for a better position to get closer to the door or the window. Okay? And in Luke chapter 5, beginning at seven, verse 17, And it was on a certain day as he was teaching, there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. So some, some preachers, some Pharisees, some doctors, some lawyers, they came in. Now they were coming in with what we could, would call a critical mind. They were here to not to agree with Jesus or to learn from him, but they were here to critically analyze what he's saying, maybe find some evidence to accuse him of something. Okay. Maybe sometimes we do that too. We go to some place or... Maybe I'm going to head to a, a rally or something where a Democrat's going to speak, and I might say, well, I'm going to go there critically. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to trust much what they say. Okay? And so that's the same way here. These people aren't coming to learn. They aren't, these uh, doctors and lawyers and Pharisees, they aren't coming to, to receive blessings from hearing the preaching of Christ, but they're here to critically listen and find everything wrong with what he says or challenge him on things because their power has been threatened. Remember, they've been called... Vipers, they've been called ones who are sick and need to be healed. And so, 
This crowd of people is around the house and these other critical men are there. And then we get this part of the story. And behold, men brought in a man, in a bed, a man which was taken with palsy. And they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude. So some friends bring their friend on this bed, on, a, on a, some type of probably a wooden board. We can think of like a pallet. They carry him in. He's lame. He can't walk. And of course, the house is surrounded. They can't even get close enough. So what are we going to do? How are we going to get this man close? Well, if we continue on, it says there, and they went upon the housetop. So you have to remember, these are flat roofs at this time. He go up to the housetop and let him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. So they remove some of the, the ceiling tiles that are up there. There must have been a way, so maybe a portion of the house you could walk safely on and others you couldn't, and they remove those tiles. And maybe they have some ropes that they tie around the corners of the pallet, and they begin to let it down in there, and they can see down in slowly, carefully, keep it even. We don't want this man, and you can imagine being the people in the house looking up, and well, Jesus stopping to preach. and Here comes this man slowly down on a pallet, and they can see him. This man can't walk. And when they saw, and when he saw their faith, he said unto the man, Thy sins are forgiven thee. What great faith these men had. They knew that Jesus could heal their friend. All they needed to do was get this, this lame friend into the presence of Christ, and he could be healed. So that was an act of faith. They knew Jesus could heal him, they knew he would do it. It wasn't, well, I wonder if he'll do it, I wonder if it's going to happen. We need to make every effort possible to get our friend in front of Jesus because once he gets there, he will be healed. And so they lower him down in there. Jesus, when he sees him, does he heal him first? No. He doesn't heal him first. Instead, he says, tells him, thy sins are forgiven. Now that's a pretty great and noble statement. Now, in hindsight, we can look back and we can say, He's a son of God. Of course he can forgive sins. But to the people there, can you imagine the murmuring in the crowd all of a sudden? What did he say? Did you hear what he said? He told the men his sins are forgiven. Well, only God can do that. He can't do that. How can he say his sins are forgiven? Did you hear what he said? His sins are forgiven. And of course, oh man, you can imagine the doctors and lawyers and Pharisees, well, immediately they're on edge. And they know that this can't be happening. No one can, no one can forgive sins but God. Okay? But before the man is healed, Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. Okay? It shows us that the forgiveness has to come before healing. Before the man can be healed first, he must be forgiven. Okay? So, we see that connection. Sin, the outward sign of, of, of sin, maybe this man is paralyzed, he's lame, is also a picture of the inward part of sin, and that must be healed first. Okay? Now this man, do we read this man of saying anything? No, we don't. The scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, so again, Jesus can know their minds, he answering said unto them, what, re what reason ye in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Rise up and walk. So Jesus is knowing their minds. He begins to say to them, Well, what do you think is easier? Is it easier to tell this lame man to get up and walk, or is it easier to, to tell this man that his sins are forgiven? Now, you and me, we'd say, well, those are both seem pretty impossible things to do. But it would be easier for me to just say, your sins are forgiven. Why is it easier to say that? I mean, I could tell Logan's, Logan's sins are forgiven. And you guys could say, well, I don't know. Why is it hard to tell if that's true, Megan? All right, Megan's exactly right. Very good, Megan. If, if Logan was lame and couldn't walk, and I said, Logan, stand up and walk, well, it would all be obvious. Either he would stand up and he could walk, or he wouldn't. And in this case, if I told him that, it wouldn't happen. And you'd say, well, see, Mr. Vanderveen, your work was worthless. But if somebody said, well, your sins are forgiven, Logan, we can't tell, like Megan said, we can't see Logan's heart. We don't know that it's, it's been wiped clean. We have no idea. We have no clue. 
So Jesus is teaching the Pharisees here that it's easier because, of course, these Pharisees, as the priests, okay, if they were involved in, in, in sacrifices and forgiving of the sins there when people bring sacrifices, well, they would make it, of course, even while your sins are not free. Well, you can't know that. So it's much, it, it would seem much easier to forgive those sins. And of course, that's what the, the leaders think that they can do when people, people go and uh, go to the temple and they offer sacrifices. Okay? But anyways, the man has to have his sins forgiven him. And then Jesus says there in verse 24, But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins, he said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy couch, and go into thine house. And immediately he rose up before them, and took up that whereupon he lay, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. Jesus has answered their questions. Yes, only God can forgive sins, and Jesus is God. But Jesus did not mean, again here, like I said, it's not easier to forgive sins in the heel, but it's easier to claim to forgive sins, which is, of course, what some may see, say, and do try to do. And it's only after this that Jesus then tells a man, now that your sins are forgiven, now arise, take up thy bed, go home. And the man does. He stands up. We don't read him speaking a word to Jesus. Okay? So, now... That's always a little bit frustrating as Christians. We may look out into the world and our sins, okay, when I sin, I feel guilt. I feel horrible. I feel awful. Like, you know, each day is just a, a miserable day to go through. That's good because that shows that I have a conscience. It shows that God is working in my heart that I need to go confess my sin. And then I need to ask for forgiveness. And I need to turn from my sin and show true repentance. I look out at the world as a Christian that may be frustrating because I see sins. And maybe a man has become a millionaire because he's, he's selling drugs. Well, that's horrible. That's awful. It appears as though temporarily, yes, the man is prospering in his sin. And he doesn't feel much guilt for it. But that's because the Holy Spirit isn't working in his heart. And we know what the end of that man will be. Right? So that can be our comfort too. So, some things we can learn from. Our lesson today, okay, just as mom or dad cares about you or a young brother or sister, you see them comforted, Jesus does the same for us and God does the same for us. He forgives your sins. He comforts us. We could know that. But let's try to be joyful too. Let's never be afraid to, to speak of how great and wonderful and marvelous the works of God are in our lives too, that he has saved you and me. Let's not go through the motions just because since birth, we can say you've been blessed in that way, growing up in a good Christian home and a good Christian church and having the beautiful blessing of going to a good Christian school. But let's try to have that joy in our hearts as well.